Hey, thanks for checking out this message. We truly hope it's a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you about how God's moving in your life and let you know a little bit how God's moving at Coastal. Take a quick second and fill out that online connect card at the bottom of this page. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you have a blessed day. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Coastal Community Church. I'm Pastor Chris. Welcome online if you're watching uh, from home or from uh, out of... Uh, uh, out of the out of town. We're glad that you're here with us today as well online. Um, hey, somebody asked me this morning if there's any salt around the rims of the glasses out in the cafe. I, I'm not sure what they were referring to, but uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. Glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, hey, man, what an awesome way to begin our service this morning. Someone getting baptized, immersed into Jesus Christ. Uh, very exciting. Um, I want to... Um, just remind everybody, listen, we're ready, and you might have noticed that week in and week out, it seems like we have more and more people that are getting baptized. Uh, last week, in fact, we had five people uh, indicate on their Connect card that they were interested in getting baptized, so which is awesome. Um, and I, I want to let everybody know that we actually have a beach baptism coming up. Uh, it's our first beach baptism of the summer, and uh, it's uh, Sunday, June the 9th uh, at 4 o'clock out at Folly Beach. And uh, it's not a... Uh, box or anything on the back of your connect card but if you wanted to this morning uh, on the back of your connect card there it says underneath my decision today right next to I gave my life to Christ today it says I would like to get baptized if you check that box and then just write literally write the word next to it beach and we will sign you up for our beach baptism and that'll be a uh, uh, its own block uh uh, sign up next week. It'll be in the bulletin next week. But I just want to go ahead and let you know about that. That's Sunday afternoon, uh, June the 9th. And uh, it's always just huge. L last year, I think we baptized 30 to 40 people. And I think we already have more than 20 people signed up for that uh, for this summer. So we're excited about that. Um, Hey, and also, really, if you're a volunteer here at Coastal, man, please come this coming Friday night. It just really is our way uh, to thank and love on our volunteers and talk about what's coming up in the fall and uh, the summer here at Coastal. Uh, I'm excited today, as always, but uh, we've been in this series called This is Jesus uh, since uh, Easter Sunday, Easter weekend. And uh, each week of the series, our goal, very simply, is just to learn a little bit more um, about Jesus. And to do that, we're kind of looking at the same question that Jesus asked his disciples almost 2,000 years ago. Who do you say that I am? In other words, you know, it doesn't really matter what your parents say, what your spouse says, what your friend says, what the culture says. What do you say? What do you really believe about the most important person who's ever lived? Well, today, in order to get to know Jesus a little bit better, I want to I want us to kind of debunk a common misconception that's out there about Jesus. Uh, here it is. Because Jesus is God. Now, at Coastal, we believe that Jesus was fully man and fully God. Uh, but because he was God, because he was perfect and he never sinned, Jesus really can't identify with everything that I have to go through. You know, I, I mean, Jesus, you know, just never faced the same challenges, the same trials, the same problems the same temptations that I face. In other words, he just doesn't understand. Now, that's a common mis misconception. Uh, but nothing, truthfully, could be further from the truth. Hebrews 4.15, in fact, says this about Jesus. Listen to this. For we do not have a high priest, he's talking about Jesus there, uh, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. So in other words, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that Jesus faced all the same challenges we face, including temptation, and yet he never gave in. And that's really what I want us to look at today. How Jesus faced temptation, how he never gave in, and how we can overcome temptation. Now, let's begin, though, with a little, a little definition uh, of temptation. If you're taking notes with us this morning, write this down. Temptation is the desire or the inclination to step outside of God's will. Okay? It's, uh, it's when we feel the desire to disobey God. It's, it's the pull that we all feel to sin. Uh, temptation is dangerous because whenever we give in to it, uh, it takes you out of God's very best for your life, and it puts you on a path toward a lesser kind of life. It leads to sin, and ultimately, it leads to death, spiritual death, separation from God. In fact, James 1, 14 and 15 puts it this way. Temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desires. There's that word again. 
These evil desires lead to evil actions, and evil actions lead to what? Death, spiritual death. Now, it's tricky, though, because temptation never tells you that. Instead, temptation makes all these great promises, but it can't deliver. Now, all of us, everyone in this room, myself included, deal with temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. In fact, we could all probably make a very, very long, long list of all the temptations that we face on a daily basis. But here's what I want you to see this morning. You might not have ever thought about this way before. No matter, no matter how many temptations you face, no matter which temptation you in particular struggle with, I think that we can fit just about every temptation into one of three categories. Okay, Those categories are found in the Bible, 1 John 2.16. Listen to this. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now look at those three. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I actually think that every temptation that you face pretty much falls into one of those three main areas. Okay, let's, let's talk about them. The lust of the flesh. You know, that, that's the temptation to, uh, you know, to do whatever feels good, whatever makes you happy in the moment. You know, today we might call it hedonism. That, that, that's the drive to satisfy your, you know, carnal, earthly desires, no matter what they are, you know, to indulge. It's a, in other words, I'm going to do what makes me feel good right now in the moment, no matter what God's Word says about it, no matter what God says or anybody else says about it. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. This is the temptation to, uh, to have more, to want more. You know, you see something and, and you want it, no matter what cost is involved. Today, we might call that materialism. And then you've got, number three, the pride of life. Now, this basically is where we you know, kind of remove God from the center of everything, from the center of our lives, and we put ourselves at the center of our lives. Everything revolves around me. It's about my status and my power. I want to be honored. I want to be elevated. I'm the focus. Now, those, those are the three big temptations of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. No matter what temptation you face, they probably fall into one of those three areas. So I want to ask you this morning, let's get really personal and really practical. Are, are one of these three a bigger problem for you than the others? And some of you might say, well, it depends on, you know, what time of the day or something. You know, I don't know. Now, if I were being honest, I would say that I struggle in all three. I'm an equal opportunity offender, okay? But my point is, nobody is immune. Nobody, even Jesus. Now, again, Hebrews 14, 4, 4, 15 that we just read tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are. And that's why he understands what we go through. And that's also why I believe that we can learn from his example. And that's what I want us to do today. I want us to learn something about Jesus, but I also want to learn from his example. In Luke chapter 4, we find this incredible story of Jesus fighting off temptation. Now, at this point, give you a little context, Jesus is about 30 years old. He was just baptized, actually, a few days earlier, and he's now about to start his public ministry. Okay, So, after he's baptized, he goes off into the wilderness to fast and to pray for 40 days. Now, many of you here at Coastal... And many of your friends, you know, you participated uh, in our 40-day Easter fast, Lent. You know, um, and, and recently, if you did that here at Coastal, you gave up something, right? You sacrificed something. Maybe for you, uh, it was chocolate, you know, or sugar, or caffeine. Uh, some of you gave up swearing, uh, or negativity, or television, all those things. But I, what I want you to see here is that Jesus' fast is, is really intense, okay? He's not just giving up one thing. He's... He's not eating any solid food for 40 days and 40 nights. Physically, at this point, he's weak and he's tired. Now, follow along as I read. It's on the screen. It'll be, it's on your outline. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now, what I want you to see first there for a second is who is doing the tempting here? Who is it? The devil, right? Now, 
And, and that's an important point to make. You see, God never tempts anyone. God doesn't tempt you. God's not the one who sends temptations into your life. He's not trying to trip you up. Okay, it continues. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, now, stop right there for a second. When did the devil come to tempt Jesus? When he was hungry. When he was weak. When he was vulnerable. And that's exactly the same for you and I. You know, uh, that's when Jesus comes to tempt us. He comes, you know, when you're vulnerable. When you're tired. When you've had a hard day, when you've just got finished, you know, arguing with your spouse. It's not an accident. Okay, that, that's a part of his, his scheme. Satan knows when you're weak, and that's when he's going to come and attack. Let's continue. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, as we go through this, I want you to help me out just a little bit. Think about it. Which one of the big three, those big three categories that I just went over, is this? It's the lust of the flesh. In fact, right off to the side on your outline, you could write that down. Write down, lust of the flesh. Remember, what's Jesus is hungry here. He's fasting. You know, Satan says, hey, eat this bread, you're going to feel good. And then Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Verse 5. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of this world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone that I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Now again, think about the big three. Which one is this one? The lust of the eyes, right? The temptation to have more. Jesus answered, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 9. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Think about it. Which one is this? The pride of life. The desire to you know, be at the center of attention. The desire to be praised. Now, we're going to kind of come back to this a little bit later, but, but, by, but by the way, what is Satan doing there? He, he's actually quoting scripture. But he's twisting it. He's twisting it to, to fit his own evil desires. And what I want you to see here, just for a second, is that he's been doing that since Adam and Eve. You know, it's one of his oldest tricks in the book. Now, that's why you need to know scripture. And we'll come to that in just a little bit. Jesus answered, it is written, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. That's another great reminder there. Until an opportune time. You know what? You never completely defeat temptation in your life. There's always going to come a next temptation. Where Satan's going to attack again. And again, he's going to come again. Now, don't miss this. If Jesus had given in to any of these temptations, he wouldn't have been able to fulfill God's plan for his life. And to be that, what, perfect sacrifice for all of our sin, for all mankind. Now, similarly, in, you know, in the same way, when we give in to temptation today, it prevents us. From living out God's purposes for our lives. Because again, what does temptation do? It leads you away. It leads you on a path away from God. It can hurt your relationships, your career, your finances, your future. And it will hurt your relationship with God. That's why this is so important. What we're talking about today. Now, I think there are some lessons here that we can learn from Jesus in how to overcome these same three temptations in our lives. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. And I want to look at each one of them this morning. So, number one, here's the first one. To overcome the lust of the flesh, i got to develop godly boundaries. Develop godly boundaries. Now, the lust of the flesh, remember, that, that's this temptation to, you know, to satisfy your desires, you know, no matter the consequences, 
uh, to watch what you want to watch, uh, to eat what you want to eat, to sleep with whoever you want to sleep with, to do whatever's going to make you feel good in the moment. That's why this temptation is so dangerous. Because it promises, you know, that if you'll do that, if you'll do these things, if you'll give in to this temptation, you're going to feel good. It's going to make everything all right. You know, if you're in pain, this is a way to numb the pain. Now, truthfully, it might make you feel good for a moment. But it never lasts. It always leaves you wanting more. And ultimately, if you give in to the lust of the flesh, it's going to end up hurting you. And it typically hurts those you care about the most. Now, there's a lot. I mean, there's this, you know, there's so many temptations in this area that we could talk about. You know, kind of this big, this category. I mean, we can talk about how people, you know, will turn to drugs, they'll turn to alcohol, even food, you know, to, to numb the pain that they're feeling. It can lead, lead to uh, substance abuse, it lead to addiction. Now, one temptation in this area that I'm pretty sure we all wrestle with is sexual temptation. One younger man asked an older pastor, uh, how, do you, how, how old do you have to be to no longer be tempted by sexual sin? And uh, the older pastor quickly responded, son, I wouldn't trust myself till I've been dead in the grave for three days. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Listen to this. Or don't you know that your body, your physical body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. By the way, that high price that he's talking about there is the death of his son Jesus. That's, that's the high price that you were bought with. So, you must honor God with your body. In other words, what the Bible is saying here is that, hey, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, a Christian, a believer, then the Holy Spirit lives within you. You are the home of the Holy Spirit. So because of that, God deeply cares what we do with our bodies. We're more than just physical. He cares about what we do with our bodies. So, one anecdote to this temptation of the flesh, especially sexual temptation, is to develop godly boundaries in, in, in our lives. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. You know, what are boundaries? Well, boundaries are, 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 boundaries are a buffer zone between you and sin. It's, it's kind of where you draw a line and you say, okay, I'm going to put some distance here between me and crossing the line over there and giving in to sin. Okay, I'm going to put some distance. In other words, I, I'm, I'm not going to get too close. I'm going to create this boundary. I'm going to back up here a little bit, this boundary for my personal protection. Now, what temptation always does, though, is it pushes our boundaries. It does. So, let's say that you're in a dating relationship, and you've decided that, you know, the line that you're not going to cross is you're not going to have sex until you're married. So, the wise thing to do is take a few steps back from the edge, you know, to create a buffer zone, to create a boundary between you and what God's Word says, that, that goal. Now, so what might that look like, practically speaking, in a dating relationship? You know, I don't know, you gotta, you got to figure that out. It, it might be that, you know, I, I'm not, not going to stay out all night with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I'm going to give myself, you know, like a personal curfew. Or I'm going to make the decision that I'm not going to sit on their bed at, in the dark, you know, making out with them, with no one around. Because that's going to put me, you know, too close to the edge. That, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up crossing the line. So that boundary creates safety. Now, so here's the question you got to figure out. When it comes to the lust of the flesh that you might be struggling with in, in any area in the lust of the flesh, you know, what boundaries do you need to create? What safety, you know, buffer zone do you need to create? You know, if you're married and uh, you're at work and there's a coworker of the opposite sex who's always, you know, you know, really close, you know, to you, you work with them in a close environment, and you, you're, you're kind of attracted to them. What boundaries do you need to create to protect your marriage? You know, I'm not going to be alone with this person. I'm not going to go out to coffee or out to lunch with this person by myself. You know, if, if I text them, I'm going to copy my wife, my, my husband. 
You know, if pornography is an issue for you, what boundaries, what, what buffer zone do you need to create? You know, maybe you put a filter on your phone or, you know, on your computer at home. You know, you talk to a friend. You tell them to hold you accountable. You know, make it difficult for you to give in. Create a buffer zone, a boundary. You know, maybe for you it's drinking. You know, maybe he's drinking too much, you know? You know what? So you, you create this buffer zone. You say, you know what? I'm just not going to go out to bars with my friends on the weekend. You know? I'm not going to party on Cinco de Mayo, you know? Whatever it is, you create about I'm not going to drink when I'm alone. Now, let me give you a little, a little secret here. Here's the biggest secret for overcoming this category, the lust of the flesh. One word. You ready for it? Write this down. Run! Run! You know, get away from whatever or whoever is tempting you. That's especially true in this area, especially true in sexual temptation. Run from it. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, back up from that passage we read earlier. What is the very first word? What's it say? Run. Run. Circle that word. Run. Run away from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And who lives in your body? The Holy Spirit. So you do whatever you have to do to, to get away, to run away. So you create these boundaries when the temptation does attack, and then you run from it. Let's talk about the second category. To overcome the lust of the eyes... I must live generously. I must live generously. Now remember what the lust of the, lust of the eyes is all about. It's the desire to have more, more of everything. And we all want more, don't we? I mean, we do. We are living in the age of discontent. You know, we talk a lot about that. We're in a, uh, we finish up financial peace tonight. Actually, having our big party. See how much debt we all paid off this, this past semester. But uh, John D. Rockefeller, the very first billionaire in America, he was once famously asked, how much money is enough? You know what he said? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. You know, more money, more stuff. i got to have more. Listen, if you let it, the lust of the eyes will leave you broke, in debt, unsatisfied, and unfulfilled. Because having more stuff does not make you more happy. It just keeps you running in circles in the pursuit of more. And that's why if you want to defeat the lust of the eyes, if you want to get off this hamster wheel chasing after more, the key is living a generous life. It's generosity. Generosity is God's antidote to the pursuit of more because every time you give, you break the grip of materialism. It breaks the grip that money has over you. That's why generous people are far happier, far more happier, healthier than other people. It's why those who give, and I know this doesn't seem to make sense financially, but those who give have far less debt than those who don't. Because generosity breaks you away from the prison of always being discontent. For looking for meaning and fulfillment and happiness in more stuff. Listen, our God created you to be generous. You were created in the image of God, and at his heart, God is a generous giver. You are, you are never more like God than when you're giving. So let me ask you, are you living a generous life? Or are you just discontent? Are you living a generous life towards God, towards others? A, a, a generous life in giving to the church. A church, by the way, that is changing lives each and every Sunday, each and every week. If you're not generous toward God, I want to challenge you to start that habit today. You know, Pastor Scott's going to come up here like he does every week. He's going to challenge you to give, encourage you to give. Use the envelope. Text. Some of you come to church every single Sunday. You don't give anything. Listen, don't give out of guilt, don't give out of pressure, but give because you don't own anything. God owns it all. And you're going to be held accountable to how you managed, leveraged everything that he gave you. And if you want to be like God, if you want to break the lust of the, eye, the, lust of the, of the eyes in your life, this temptation, then start being generous. Because when you give something away, you break the grip of materialism. Open your eyes to the needs of others. And... and 
and do your best to meet those needs. Listen, you want to break the grip of materialism in your life? Man, you come to Saturday serve here at Coastal. You give to somebody else. Listen, you want to, you want to break this, you know, this hole that, that this has in, in people's lives? Come to Summer of Impact. The whole month of June, we're going to give you an opportunity to give your life away in service to other people. To be the hands and feet of Jesus here in our community where we live, work, and play. You know, in your bulletin today, there is, a, there is a catalog, and it's just got a list of opportunity after opportunity to serve, to give, to share, to love our community, to be Jesus to our community. Have you signed up yet? Have you done that? Or are you too busy? Because you're chasing after what this world has. You're just spinning the plates. And you make excuses, and you've got excuse after excuse. But are you generous? Are you generous toward God, toward the church, toward others? Whatever you give, you get so much more in return. In fact, Jesus said it that way. Look at Luke 6, 38. This is Jesus, by the way. That's what this series is all about. Listen to what he said. If you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you. Listen to this. In full measure, think about a cup, okay? Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. Because you can't outgive God. And if you'll, if you'll let God, he'll, he'll let your life just be a funnel. You keep giving, he'll keep giving to you. You keep giving, he'll keep giving to you. Because the more you bless other people, the more God blesses you. Here's what I know. There are many people that sit in this room today who need freedom in this area because you are discontent. And your your life is controlled right now by the size of your bank account, by the size of your home, by how much stuff you have. In and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with money, there's nothing wrong with stuff, there's nothing wrong with things, but you cannot find your happiness in those things. You're just going to get more stressed out, more distracted, more driven to get more. And that's why God's antidote to the lust of the eyes is to live a generous life. Number three, this third category, probably the most dangerous temptation of all, the pride of life. To overcome the pride of life, number three, I must center my life on God's word. i got to center my life on God's word. Now, I said the pride of life may very well be the most dangerous because pride ultimately is the source of all sin. All sin finds its beginning in pride because sin is when I say, God, I think my way is better than your way, so I'm going to go my way. I'm not going to listen to you. That's pride. When I make myself God, when everything is about me, you know, I want the glory, I want the power, I want the attention, the praise, everything revolves around me, how it impacts me, I'm the boss, I'm God. So how do we overcome that? Well, I think Jesus gives us the answer. You know, the way Jesus overcame, not not only the pride of life, by the way, but all three of these temptations, was by centering his life on the word of God. In fact, if you look closely, you'll see that Jesus used the word of God to overcome all three of these temptations. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every single time he was tempted by Satan, he basically used the exact uh, same words. You'll you'll see these in all the different translations in verse 4, verse 8, and verse 12. It basically says, it is written. This is what it says. It is written. It is written. Do you you see what Jesus is doing there? He's fighting temptation with Scripture. With the word of God. Whenever Satan threw a temptation in Jesus' face, Jesus threw scripture back in Satan's face. By the way, you, now think about this, okay? If Jesus, fully man and fully God, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, if he needed the word of God to overcome temptation in his life, don't you think we need it as well? I mean, that's why the key to overcoming the pride of life and really any temptation you you face is to make sure your life is centered on the Word of God. Why? Because God's Word is true. It is unchanging. It's eternal. It doesn't change 
with the culture. It doesn't change with popular opinion or vote. It doesn't change with the trends. It stands forever, and it'll help you stand strong against any temptation that you face. So let's get real practical. How do you do that? How do you utilize God's Word to fight off temptation? Well, real simple. You know, you do what Jesus did. You, you memorize Scripture. And I don't know what some of you are saying. I can't do that. I can't memorize things. Yes, you can. You memorize whatever's important to you. You do. You put God's Word in your heart and in your mind so that it's there for you to bring up, for God to bring up whenever you're facing a temptation. Because, because, here's the thing. You know, Tonight, Cinco de Mayo, when you're tempted to drink too much. When, when uh, you know, tomorrow at work, when you're tempted to flirt with that woman or that man who's not your spouse. When you're tempted to buy, you know, that watch or that phone that you really don't need and you know you can't afford. You're probably not going to have your Bible with you in the moment. You're probably not going to pull it out and say, whoa, 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 wait a second. I'm being tempted here. You know, let me see if I can find something that's going to help me. That's probably not going to happen. And so, as it did with Jesus, temptation is going to hit you when, when, remember, when you're most vulnerable, when you're at your weakest, when you're not prepared. So you better have some scripture that's been stored away in your heart and in your mind so that, that in that moment's notice, it can help fight off that temptation. So how do you do that? You know, how, how, do you, how do you begin to store up verses in your heart and your mind? Well, for starters, you ready for this? It's so simple. You spend time in God's Word. You know, you make that a priority. First thing you do when you get up in the morning, you spend a few minutes in the Word of God. You know, maybe, you know, you, you make God's Word and, and, and God's people a priority. You make going to that life group a priority. You make attending worship a priority because what do we do here? We center on the Word of God. And maybe you take home that, you know, the, the sermon note sheet. You say, man, that's a verse right there. I need to read that one over again. I need to memorize that one. You put these scriptures in your mind and in your heart so that they're there for you. What does Psalm 119.11 say? I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's what God wants you to do. Now, I don't, I don't know what temptation you are facing today. I don't know which one of these categories has got a stranglehold on you today. Maybe you're dealing with an addiction. Maybe it's sexual temptation. Maybe it's just this overwhelming desire to have more, more attention, more stuff. You're not content. Whatever it is, whatever it is, listen. This is Jesus. He understands. And he promises that, that he's going to be there and he's going to help you through every temptation that you face. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. I want to close with this verse. But remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. Listen to me. We're all in the same boat. You know, sometimes, man, that's the trick that Satan uses. Oh, you scum. You're the only one dealing with, with this. No, you're not. We're all dealing with it. We all face it. We're in this together. Then it says, and God is what? What's the next word? He is Faithful. He is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. And when you are tempted, when? When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. There's always a way out. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't. But I know this. Jesus does. He knows what you're facing, and he understands, he's been through it, and he cares for you. And he wants to help you, whatever, whatever you're facing today, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we have a Savior who understands. Fully God and yet fully man. And he went through all the same temptations that we face. 
Father, you know, the truth is right here in this room today or watching us online, I, my guess, and I know it because we've all been there, we're, we're in this together. There's someone here right now that is in a struggle. They're in a fight, a fight for their life. Listen, Jesus cares for you. He understands. He's been through it. You know, what, what boundaries do you need to put in place? You know, how do you need to step back and start again, start afresh in that, in that area? Whatever it is. You know, the lust of the eyes, are you generous? Are you generous to the church? Are you generous toward others? Do you live your life in such a way to to serve and give to God and to give to, to others? And what about the Word of God? You know, it's amazing. I, I know from personal experience, when I, you know, when, I, when I step away from Scripture, when I spend less and less time with you, Father, and with your Word, man, that's when I, I tend to fall. I know it. And I see it as a pastor, God. People who, who walk away from you, walk away from the church and from your word and your people and worship. Man, that's when they're vulnerable. That's when they're weak. Listen, if that's you today, come home. Come back. Center your life on the word of God. Listen, Jesus has defeated sin and death. He did it by living that perfect life and then sacrificing his life for us. He was the payment for our sin. And you can be clean. You can be made brand new today completely by giving your life to Him. Listen, call out to Him now. Just pray a prayer like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I have blown it. And not only do I know that I'm tempted, I know that I have given in over and over again. I'm a mess. I admit it, God. I am a sinner. But today, I want to come home. Today, I want to be forgiven. Father, I believe. I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he was tempted in all ways, and yet he did not give in. I believe that he went to the cross to, as a payment for me and my sin. And I believe, God, that he rose from the dead and he is alive. And Father, for the rest of my days, I want to follow him. I ask him now to come into my life to be my Savior, to be my Lord. And I ask Him to forgive me. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, God has adopted you into His forever family. The Bible says that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is saved. And Father, today, may we all live a life worthy of our calling. And may we recognize that Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And you have given us a way out from temptation on a path of life and purpose and meaning. And may we stay on that path. We love you, Father. We pray these things today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.